Okay, so good afternoon everyone and I'm delighted to be here today to talk about um, care and an ageing population. My name's Jane Robertson, I'm a lecturer in Dementia Studies in the Faculty of Social Sciences here at the University of Stirling. I'm a research interest centre around quality of life and well-being for older people in general and people with dementia in particular. So many of you will have personal experience of dementia amongst relatives and friends and many of you will be aware that um, there's an increasing number of people affected by dementia right across the world and Scotland is obviously affected in the same way. So it's therefore a key social policy issue and developing effective health and social care services is a priority for policymakers in Scotland. So in the context of thinking about ageing and social policy, I'll look specifically at issues of dementia, care and choice in this particular lecture. So you may be surprised by statements such as people with dementia don't have a voice or people with dementia can't be part of decision making about their care. However, these types of assumptions have guided responses to people with dementia and how we support them in terms of traditional understandings of dementia and approaches to care. So today I'm going to look at some alternative, more recent social policy approaches that recognise people with dementia as active agents in their care as opposed, as opposed to passive recipients, which is a more traditional conceptualisation. But before I do that, I'll do a brief introduction to dementia and the, the place of dementia in an ageing population in Scotland. Okay, so dementia itself is the name or a label for a number of, of underlying conditions or syndromes that are all characterised by progressive cognitive impairment. So dementia is associated with a loss of cognitive capacity in three key areas. The first is in terms of a deterioration of memory over time. Also, people's language tends to be disrupted and people do have difficulties with decision making and that tends to increase as dementia progresses. And in the UK, Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia and that affects around two thirds of people living with dementia in the UK. Vascular dementia is the next most common condition and that affects around a fifth of people and some people have both Alzheimer's and vascular, that's the next kind of biggest group of people, and it's called mixed dementia. Now there are many other conditions that are associated with dementia, over a hundred different types, but the most common of these kind of rarer conditions are frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body disease, and alcohol-related dementia as well. So thinking about dementia in terms of the context of an ageing population in Scotland, there are currently estimated to be around 90,000 people living with dementia in Scotland. And most people that have got a diagnosis of dementia are aged over 65 years of age, and that's termed late onset dementia. And the reason I mention this, although this lecture is about ageing, Obviously, it has implications for this, the small number of people that have early onset dementia that are less than 65 years of age because health and, self, health and social care services are generally framed around policy agendas for older people. And as I'll explore later in the lecture, that does have implications for younger people affected by the condition. Nearly two thirds of people with dementia live in the community. And although a lot of um, public portrayals of dementia has very kind of severe dementia that's represented, most people living with dementia in the community have mild symptoms. And so we need to take account when we're thinking about social policy of supporting people who are living at home as well as supporting people who are living in nursing and residential care. So the relationship to ageing is that the prevalence of dementia increases with age. So the older a person is, the more likely it is they'll be diagnosed with dementia. And Scotland, like other countries right across the world, has an increasingly ageing population, which means the proportion of people over 65 years of age is increasing. 
So that means with the prevalence of dementia being increased with age, the more older people there are in society, the more people will be affected by dementia. And it's estimated by 2050 that the number of people living with dementia will double. So given this projection, there's also going to be more and more people affected by dementia. But some recent good news is that while the, proportion, the number of people with dementia is increasing because of an ageing population. The rate of this increase is slowing, which some people think is to do with improved public health over the last couple of decades. And in the popular press, often ageing and dementia is portrayed as a demographic time bomb, which is really quite misleading and unhelpful because it represents dementia as something that society and ageing is things that society cannot cope with. And there obviously are real challenges for health and social care systems and for resources, but it is misleading to contextualise ageing and dementia in that way. But the, the reality is, nevertheless, that with increasing numbers of people affected by dementia, policymakers do need to think about how to plan and deliver care for people in the context of obviously limited resources. And there's some links at the bottom of this page that you can look at if you're interested in more details about how dementia affects people in Scotland and also the UK. So I've given you a kind of introduction in terms of dementia being a key health and social care issue in Scotland. And in the first part of the lecture, I'm going to look at the principle of choice and Peter Matthews, your module coordinator, will have already explored um, choice and service delivery. So I'm going to look at it in the context of dementia around two particular policy areas. The first is around personalisation and self-directed support. So I'll provide some analysis of how that concept has developed in terms of personalisation and the mechanisms of achieving that, which is self-directed support, and I'll explain that in more detail what that means during the lecture. And I'll also look at research which explores service users' perspectives, what people living with long-term conditions like dementia say about this type of policy agenda and how it fits with their own needs and choices. The second part of the lecture will look at co-production and partnership and services as different ways to involve people with long-term conditions like dementia. And I'll give examples of two projects where people have developed this way of working to try and improve services for people affected by dementia and other long-term conditions. And in this part of the lecture, I'll also consider diversity and social inclusion as these are important aspects that affect older people just like any other members of society. So taking first, um, looking at policy approaches to choice and how that relates to dementia. Health and social care generally over the last two decades has emphasised service user engagement for people with a variety of different types of conditions. And incorporating the service user perspective has been particularly prominent in the physical disability field and a mental health um, arena as well, but particularly among younger people. And there's been much less focus on how older people and people with dementia might be supported in this particular way. But there are existing groups of people with dementia that are working to have their choices and voices heard in relation to services and one such example is the Scottish Dementia Working Group which is a group comprised of people living with dementia and it's been very important in lobbying the Scottish Government to improve services for people with dementia generally and also working with them to develop national strategies for managing key public policy issues such as diagnosis of dementia, post-diagnostic support and more recently, with the new strategy coming up, they'll be looking at end-of-life issues and palliative care. So the national dementia strategies have been informed by a rights-based framework where um, the citizenship of people with dementia are emphasised. So the first strategy was in 2010. So the people um, from the Scottish Dementia Working Group directly informed that and worked with the government to develop priorities and accountability and participation were important aspects of this. So the assertions were made that people with dementia should have full participation in their care and they should also be able to assist people in developing policy around this area. In 2013 there was even more of an emphasis, this was the second strategy, 
on rights-based approaches and how people can be supported by recognising dignity and respect, but also focusing on things like empowerment as concepts. And the third strategy is due to be launched at the end of the year. There's no specific date being given, but rights-based approaches is still an emphasis. So that's something to consider and, and reflect the different type of assumptions about people with dementia that I mentioned at the start in terms of this view that people with dementia might not have a voice. And in terms of service user choice and control in support and services, there's been a broad movement over the last two decades to give people increased control and flexibility and choice about the type of support they receive. And within this, there's been the promotion of the concept of personalisation. And that idea, it's not a specific service, but an approach to working with people that, th that takes um, as its kind of most important principle that people should have choice and have services personalised to their own particular needs. And there's a link with legislation that's particularly relevant to people with dementia. And as people, um, because their cognitive capacity is affected by the condition, there are two acts, one in Scotland called the Adults with Incapacity Act and another the Mental Capacity Act in England and Wales, which are there to safeguard the rights of people with dementia and to ensure that their choices are still respected even as their condition um, develops. And this, these pieces of legislation cover a variety of people with various conditions that might affect their cognitive capacity. So the idea is that the promotion of social policy agendas like personalisation should empower people with dementia and other people in similar situations. And the legislation is there to protect their rights to continue to be heard even when cognitive capacity diminishes. So I've got a video here that I'm about to play that looks at personalisation in residential care and about a third of people with dementia are living in either a nursing home or a residential home. And I'd like you to watch this and think about the potential benefits of this type of approach for care for someone that's living with dementia. Then we'll give you two minutes to discuss this with someone sitting nearby you and then we'll move on to the next part of the lecture. So I'll just click on the link here to start the video. And we'll just watch the first few minutes. was set up almost 20 years ago to look after people who had profound mental health needs due to their dementia. At that time in Oxfordshire, the only place that you could go for that sort of, of care was to a general care home or into hospital. Marjorie de Field came to live with us last summer. When I went to assess Marjorie in the previous care home, I saw a lady who was sitting quietly in her own room. She didn't engage much with me in conversation. She needs some water. I'll get a drink in a moment. Her son had told us that she used to play the organ in the local church and had a lot of pleasure in it. Music had been a very important part of her life. Have a go. Have a go. Have a go, Joe. Have a go. We then decided that we would try and sit with her for a very short period each day and see if she could pick up tunes again. So we would sing again to her. And she started again picking up those tunes and playing some of those favourite hymns. It's given her back some of her dignity. This afternoon she's actually going out to a concert with volunteer, and we think that she'll really enjoy that. Are you looking forward to the concert? Are you looking forward to the concert, Marjorie? 
It would be very easy for us to forget that, that our residents are individual people with their own personal history and their own background and their own things that they'd like to do and that they've been proud of. Because we're having to care for people, we're having to help bathe them, we're having to help dress them, we're having to help them have their meals. And all of that has to be done in a nurse's or a carer's day's work. The easy way to do it would be just to treat everyone the same, to presume that all people over the age of 60 like to sit in a chair on the television for the most part of the day, or that they all like the same food. It would be very easy to get into the wrong way of doing it, but that would be to give good person-centered care. If I were ill, or if my mother was ill, I would want people to remember who she was, what her background was, the things that she used to like to do. And that's very important for us here at Bowman House. Indeed, the whole process goes much more smoothly if we treat people as individuals. When Bowman House was developing itself, de developing the Okay, so spend two minutes now, find someone that's near you and discuss what you think are potential benefits of this approach to care for Marjorie. I'll let you know when two minutes are up. And for those that are listening again online, take two minutes to think about and reflect on potential benefits for Marjorie. Okay, so having spoken, that's two minutes up now, and having spoken to a couple of you, you can clear that people are seeing the, the benefits for this in terms of being very person-centred, focusing on Marjorie as an individual, her likes and wishes, and using activities to kind of stimulate and engage her in terms of her music. And that's something that's been a past interest that the care home has tried to bring in to involve her. 
And the Cairo manager mentioned well-being and how that's an important aspect. And other people, some of the groups here have mentioned that about this focus on well-being as an outcome. So this personalisation agenda is focusing on outcomes and thinking about well-being. And also the manager emphasises um, dignity and respect. And those are the types of ideas that are reflected in the Charter of Rights for people with dementia in Scotland. So these are all important aspects. Another important aspect, which perhaps isn't specific to personalisation, but I think is an important point in this video, is that um, Marjorie supported to go outside the residential care home to visit a community um, event or organisation. And in that way, it's taking Marjorie out into the community as opposed to just kind of segregate, segregating her in a residential care home. So thinking about, you know, we've spoken about the outcomes of personalisation there in terms of Marjorie. So thinking about the mechanisms by which personalisation can be achieved. In the UK, and this applies obviously to Scotland because at the moment social policy, although it will be changing, is currently um, in this area a UK-wide framework. And personalisation is achieved in the UK through self-directed support. So again, it's not a specific service, but a way of working with people with dementia. And there are three main ways through which self-directed support can be organised. So the first, as we saw in the case of Marjorie, is in the residential care service here. Services were personalised by that agency to make them person-centred. But for people living in the community, there are two main mechanisms. One's called direct payments, and the other one is an individual budget. And the main difference between the two is who actually manages the finances. So with a direct payment, an allocated amount of money for an individual is literally given to that person to help them choose what services or support that they want, but they actually manage the budget, so they will buy the services or employ people directly to provide services and support. So sometimes people have used that to buy personal assistance. Um, to pay for personal assistance. And again, that's been much more common in the field of physical disability amongst younger people. And people have tended to put down the kind of lack of uptake among older people and people with dementia specifically to do with the complexity of hiring someone and then managing their employment. The other um, way of delivering self-directed support at the moment is through an individual budget. And that's where a local authority will allocate a certain amount of money to an individual, but rather than giving that money direct to the person, the local authority manages it for the person. So instead of, for example, traditional routes where someone might go to a daycare service for, someone with, for people with dementia, a person might choose to attend some kind of leisure activity or class. It's just a general, general activity within the community, and they would ask the council to spend money on that service and paying for them to attend that rather than going down the traditional route of a daycare service. So in that way, individual budgets and direct payments can be used to give people more choice and to develop flexibility in terms of the types of services people can access. And the other um, point is that it can also improve consistency, which is important for people with dementia because kind of routines and familiar faces are important if someone's memory is deteriorating. And if you're able to pay for services or pay for a team of personal assistance, that can provide consistency. And it can be helpful, particularly for people with dementia, to help them to live at, long, um, live at home for longer, which for most people, that's what people want to achieve, to live at home for as long as they can and you know, avoid or delay having to go into some form of residential or nursing care. And because dementia affects people in such individual ways, self-directed support can, has the potential to be flexible in terms of fitting around existing types of support, which is often within a family context and people providing informal support and services can then be brought in to suit how that family are living and to support the person in that way. So I've already mentioned that the uptake of direct payments is not so common among older people and people with dementia. So Alzheimer's Scotland um, commissioned a study 
in 2010 that looked at self-directed support specifically for people with dementia living in Scotland. And there's a link to the executive summary at the bottom of this slide. And in their research, they found that people wanted to have personalised services, but people at, at this point in time, in 2010, really didn't have that much choice or control over the types of services they received. But the positive findings that did come out of the report was that local authorities were trying to increase choice for people and were trying to involve people a little bit more in decision making, but it wasn't really at the stage where people were um, able to access very personalised services and people weren't taking up the options of self-directed support through individual budgets or direct payments. And they found three particular barriers as to why people with dementia didn't use this form of personalising support. And the first was the requirement to have someone willing to take on the formal responsibilities with a direct payment in particular. So there's a lot of bureaucracy and administration around that. And for people with dementia, if they're having some difficulties with their cognitive skills, that can be overwhelming. And if someone's to take on that responsibility for them, it involved having to get a power of attorney so that the person could take control of a person's financial affairs and all the complications associated with that. Another barrier is the eligibility threshold. So for some people, for, for, to access this type of support, there are certain requirements. And sometimes people couldn't access self-directed support until their dementia was quite significant and when it got to that stage it was difficult um, to plan services and access support in a planned way which is really how self-directed support is supposed to help people. And finally the time to taken to set up payments can be prohibitive for people and that often puts people up off using this type of support. And there are two other barriers to self-directed support in the UK that are relevant, and I'm about to explore that in relation to some research that's on your reading list. And the first is what I've mentioned there about people needing support um, from carers to access direct payments. In general, people with dementia who do require support often as their condition develops risk being excluded from the benefits of personalisation without professional support from appropriate practitioners and in turn practitioners need organisational support to be able to, to deliver personalised care because it is often time and resource intensive. So we'll now look at some research evidence and I say this is on your reading list, it's a study by Gridley and colleagues just a couple of years ago. And the study was based in England, looking at English social care, but because this is a UK-wide policy framework, it has relevance for lessons for the Scottish context. And they spoke to people that were living with a number of different complex long-term conditions, and this included people that were affected by dementia, people with dementia, and carers. So I've chosen quotes that link specifically to these perspectives. So people talked, um, again like the Alzheimer's Scotland report, they reported that they didn't tend to take up individual budgets or direct payments as a form of self-directed support. However, people valued person-centred ways of working among staff so that people could personalise services. And in this quote here, the wife of a man with dementia says, rather than putting them all in pigeonholes, putting all people with dementia in pigeonholes, this person's got dementia, we'll do this, 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 and this. So it doesn't always fit that's what's going to work for that person. So it's talking about how if people don't individualise care like we saw in Marjorie's case, it's not going to fit with an individual's choices and needs. So people focused in the research on the importance of having flexible care pathways and practitioners being creative in their approaches to supporting people and for people with dementia, that often involved having the opportunity to change arrangements once they were in place, because if someone's conditions changes, they might need to access support and services in a different way. The other aspect that was emphasised in terms of having the importance of staff was around reliability and continuity of professional support. So in this quote from a wife of someone with dementia, 
The woman says, you just can't start again. By the time you've gone through everything, you had to tell them, and this means different carers. And plus, by then, my husband was very, if I wasn't here, it needed to be someone that he knew, otherwise he would be anxious. You could see in his face the anxiety. So this person is emphasising the importance of having continuity of care from different service, different carers um, in a service because as someone's dementia progresses, having different people coming in all the time, which does sometimes happen, for example, in home care services, can be very disorientating for the person because they don't recognise them, and it can be unsettling for the carer who's then worrying about the relative with dementia. And as well as the importance of professional support, this research emphasised the importance of organisational support. So again, participants talked about having um, flexible approaches to delivery of care, so they're not being a standard pathway to dementia because it affects people so differently. And people were looking to have individual key workers or case managers who could coordinate care. So in this um, example, the first quote under case management coordination, the person said, if I need anything, I can just ring them up and they'll put me right. Another woman with a brain injury said she's like a whirlwind, this practitioner that she was referring to. And you ring her up and you tell her your problem and she will go to the end of the earth to sort the problem out. So these quotes really illustrate the importance of person-centred working, which certainly links to ideas of personalisation. But the service users are emphasising the importance of expertise and knowledge amongst professional staff to support them and also the importance of flexibility and coordination of services. And there really isn't that much discussion about financial or budgetary mechanisms, so thinking about direct payments and self-directed support. It wasn't something that people particularly used or even wanted to use. So these um, quotes and this conclusion that Gridley comes to is that everyday understandings of personalisation can be quite different from the types of social policy frameworks that are, are serving to kind of structure the way care is delivered and supported. So po social policy frameworks are very much focusing on empowerment through having financial and budgetary independence, whereas people that are affected by dementia are focusing much more on being enabled through person-centred ways of working amongst professionals and their organisations. So in this way, personalisation as viewed by service users, is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. So in this first part of the lecture, looking at personalisation in health and social care, I've outlined how the principles of service user involvement, choice and control are all important aspects of this policy agenda. And as in the case of Marjorie and the video that we watched, we can see the importance of person-centred outcomes for dementia care. And this has certainly been backed up by the research by Gridley that says this is what service users are looking for, person-centred ways of working. But in terms of delivering personalisation for individuals, in the policy framework, self-directed support is the main mechanism through which people are being supported to have choice and control. However, service users are emphasising much more strongly the importance of having professional support to manage complex needs, and dementia is a condition that has a variety of different needs and complexity around it. So I'm now going to think about service user engagement in terms of partnerships. So we've looked with personalisation how there's been an increase over the last decade or so of thinking about how care can be personalised and made more individual for, for someone living with dementia. So there's been, I mean, although that is happening and people are considering person-centred outcomes, because of the, some of the assumptions about dementia, it can still be the case that professionals and services will focus on what they think is a person-centred way of working with someone However, the person might not actually have much say in the decisions that are made. So therefore, there's been much more emphasis really in just in the last few years about thinking of people with dementia as equal partners in their care and focusing on reciprocity and how people can collaborate together, how service users can collaborate 
with the professionals to have more of a say in how services are planned and delivered. And there's this model of authentic partnership is discussed um, in the reading list, you've got a reference to this, and it's a way of working with people with dementia that's been promoted by Dupuy and colleagues. And it, they're based in Canada, and they've been doing really interesting work thinking about how to work um, with different people that have dementia. And their model emphasises the importance of having um, and valuing different perspectives so the different stakeholders should all be involved in thinking about how care should be delivered. So that will be the person with dementia, family carers, as well as professionals. And the particular aspects that are emphasised within this model are things like communication, connection, encouraging critical reflection about the way that people are working together and the way services are delivered, and also relationships. So you can see it's a much more holistic type of model and goes further than the personalisation agenda that we've just been discussing. Now the link at the bottom of the slide to the Bias Forest Guides are really examples of how this type of partnership model has been developed in some real work with people with dementia. So these guides are examples where people with dementia and carers have worked to develop toolkits and ideas for supporting other people with dementia. So you can see how they're having a much more active role in terms of designing and planning the type of services that they think other people living with these types of challenges associated with dementia might have. Okay, so I've got another exercise and I'd like you to think about the term co-production and what this might mean to you, specifically thinking about people with dementia. So again, I'd like you to spend a couple of minutes discussing this with someone near you. And then I've got three statements here and think about which of these three statements best reflects your understanding of what co-production would mean. And we'll have a, a vote with a show of hands after two minutes. And for those that are listening again, again, if you just um, reflect on what you think these different statements mean. Okay, so I'll let you know when two minutes is up, if you can discuss these statements with other people beside you. Okay, so let's have a vote on which statement best reflects co-production. Who thinks the first statement is most accurate for how you would imagine co-production might work? No, no takers. What about the second statement? Okay, so it's a few kind of hesitation. And the third statement, does that mean that most people think that? Yeah, okay. Well, 
It's probably, as you'll, you'll have guessed, actually, it's a bit of a trick question because <laughs> all three statements are actually relevant to co-production for people with dementia. So it does start from the idea that no one person or group is more important than another. And it goes back to this idea about people with dementia being treated as active agents in their own care as opposed to passive recipients. So this links to the National Dementia Strategy and the rights-based approach for involving people with dementia fully in participating in their care, but also being involved in assisting policymakers to plan and deliver services. So but the third statement, and I suppose it, it makes sense that most people voted um, for that one because I suppose the outcome of co-production will be in an ideal world that services will be provided in an equal and reciprocal relationship between service providers and service users. However, as many of you will probably imagine, this is still fairly unusual in many areas, but specifically in relation to older people and people with dementia. This type of approach is still really in its infancy. But I have got two projects I'd like to discuss today that do involve people in this more kind of partnership way of working. And the first one is a telecare project that's for older people living with long-term conditions generally in Scotland, but also this includes people with dementia. And Scotland is viewed um, as one of the leading countries in, in Europe for developing telecare and different technological approaches to delivering health and social care. And it's particularly relevant in Scotland given the number of people that are living in rural and remote areas that are out with the immediate central belt where most services and support is provided. So this um, particular project looked at how people living with long-term conditions could be involved in designing different forms of telecare and technological kind of support for people living with long-term conditions and getting them to think about how it could be implemented so it is very much a case of service users working with service providers to plan and design services. And the aim is you know, to develop a new model of service delivery, but also to engage with um, dealing with the increasing demands on health and social care services. And so part of the work was setting up an online self-management hub. And this video link, um, which I'll just click on to play just gives you a very brief description of how the older people in this project worked alongside service providers to deliver this type of service. When designing a new service, the best people to help shape it are the people who will be using it. And here at Living Without, public, patients, caterers, healthcare staff, and third-party partners for, for, for us, co design is really getting out there and meeting people in the community, finding out what's important to them and finding ways where we can build that into the, the design, the services, the, the, the interactions that, that we are providing to and ultimately improve the design. Bringing the idea of the community to our design and creative teams allows us to work together to make Living It Up work exactly how you need to. So what we're basically saying, let the public decide. At the end of the day, we are consumers. I am a consumer of health and care services. I should be able to pick how I interact with those services. Let's play to our strengths. Let's unlock that hidden resilience that's within our communities and make it available to them. So over the last few months, we've helped everything from stakeholders in Highland, pop-up shops and store employees, one-to-one sessions in Lothian, feedback groups in Fourth Valley, workshops and learning, all with the aim of being here in the top one. It's, a, it's very much a, you know, the, the user at the end of the day is the important part, the customer, like, is the important part, you know, uh, uh, and it's got to be designed and work for the end user. So far, the users have helped us make key decisions on everything from the way in which they could serve a shared function through to local design, and from creating experience guides based on situations we've been through to gather the resource links from groups and services that they have in the hospital. All of this valuable information has been captured, analysed, and fed back, 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 back,
So they're looking for something that they can click on or touch or recognise very, very clearly. So the design element is already being influenced by what people are telling us. Over the coming months, Living It Up will continue to co-design with all parts of the community across the five parts areas, where we are no doubt that we will continue to uncover many more valuable knowledge and information to help us continue the Living It Up journey. Okay, so you can see from this video there's an emphasis on resilience. One of the, the people talks specifically about that concept and this type of service model which is focusing on collaboration and partnership is very much thinking about people living with long-term conditions as having assets and capabilities that they can still bring to thinking about services and also contributing to the wider community. And an interesting part of the self-management hub is in thinking about support and services for people. There is, um, or there are links to different services and formal support, but there's also an emphasis on how people can join in, in local community events and how they can also volunteer and give their um, services or knowledge to other people as well. So it's very much focusing on the things that people can still bring which again is important in dementia when people often focus on the deficits and the losses that are associated with the condition. So the other project I'm going to mention is called Present and it's a specific project that involves people with dementia and it's based in Eastern Bartonshire, not that far away from here. And again, it's moving to a more thinking about capacity and resilience. So when they're working with people with dementia, they're moving from needs assessments, which is thinking, again, more in terms of the language of dependence and what people need, to capabilities and what strengths people still have in working within that area. And in this sense, it's thinking about how people can, can contribute still to their own personal outcomes, but also how they can contribute to the outcomes of other people. So it's thinking people of, um, treating people with dementia as being um, able to still contribute to their community and to social outcomes more generally. And priority areas were developed from co-production labs and similar to the telecare project, this involved workshops and discussions between people affected by dementia, so people living with the condition, their carers and different service providers from the, the private, public and third sectors. And they focused on three priority areas, which I think would be beneficial for all people and not just people with dementia, which shows you the kind of the more positive way that this service has been delivered. So thinking about building caring communities, increasing mobility and connectivity and having fun together. And a particularly interesting focus of this type of work was an, an intergenerational approach. So it was trying to bring together all ages within the community to think about how to improve care and support for people with dementia. And there's a link again on this slide for anyone that would be interested in the report. It's quite a short report and it's quite interesting and nicely written. So while we've talked about partnership and collaboration, it's important to highlight that just as in other areas of society, amongst older people, individuals from minority groups are still underrepresented and can be marginalised within research as well as within service planning and development and also in the delivery of care. And people from marginalised communities will often face additional barriers. And if someone has dementia, that in itself can present barriers to do with the, the condition itself and cognitive impairment, but also particularly the social stigma around dementia and how people can conceptualise someone living with dementia. But if someone has um, an additional um, aspect of their life, so for example, if someone's from a minority ethnic group, it can be the case that services are not set up to recognise the cultural, linguistic and religious needs that these people might have because services are still very much framed within the UK from the idea of a white, traditional British family. And this also has implications for LGBT people. And I've got a reference that's hopefully in your reading list, but if not, it's on um, the reference list at the end of this presentation by Conconon, who's done work with older LGBT people to understand how UK policy frameworks 
influence um, approaches to providing support and care for older LGBT people. And he actually reflects um, on the importance, or potential anyway, of self-directed support um, to provide services that are more geared to the diverse needs of people, which takes us back to the beginning of the lecture and thinking about personalisation again. So he thinks that that's a good way of promoting inclusion when traditional services don't meet an individual's needs because they're not inclusive enough. And if we are developing participatory and collaborative approaches, it's important that we do think about social inclusion and making sure that we account for everyone's needs because if we're being person-centred, we have to be aware of diversity. And I mentioned at the start of the lecture that most of the care and support that's set up for people with dementia is based around policy agendas for older people. And obviously that's fitting for many, if not most, people with dementia, given that most people with dementia are over 65 years of age. But this does have implications for younger people with dementia. So one of the flagship policies of the Scottish Government over the last few years has been free personal care for older people. And that's been done with very positive intentions to facilitate distributive social justice amongst older people to make sure that if someone has a long-term condition that means that they require personal care, that that is provided free at the point of delivery, like the health care, so that people are supported properly. But the result is that younger people with dementia who require personal care do not get it free, so that means that they don't have the same choices as older people. And 65 is really an arbitrary age category, you know, which separates people with late onset dementia and people with early onset dementia, and it's you know created this two-tier system. So the link on this slide is to a news story that's about um, Frank Copel, who used to play for Dundee United, and he developed early onset dementia. And the result was that he couldn't access any free personal care until very late in his condition, to the point where he was nearing the end of his life. And since his death in 2014, his wife's been campaigning to make personal care free to all people with dementia, irrespective of their age. So this is an example where we can think about how policy frameworks might be set up with very positive intentions, but actually have negative consequences for some minority groups, in this case, younger people with dementia. So to summarise this second part of the lecture, I've highlighted that people with dementia are traditionally marginalised due to stigma and assumptions about incapacity. But more recently, partnership and collaborative approaches have been developed for people living with dementia. Service users from marginalised communities can face additional barriers, and thinking back to the original policy agenda that I discussed about personalisation and self-directed support, this might be a way for promoting social inclusion and supporting diversity in people's experiences. So, thinking about choice, a new vision of people with dementia as active co-producers of their care and as contributing to positive personal social and social outcomes is something that really requires an infrastructure of co-production that's underlying service systems. And the example of present that I talked about in Eastern Bartonshire is an important first step in trying to scale up these approaches to involving people in a more collaborative way. But really, for this to happen to any great extent requires a transformation how services are delivered for people with dementia. So choice for people with dementia can be a reality, but obviously is going to require ambition and further innovation. So thank you very much for listening today. I've got references on the slide if you want to follow these up and contact details if you want to ask any questions. So thank you very much.